Welcome back folks to 2 Bits 1 Puck. I'm your host, Mr Intangibles and a complicated man, Dan Masters, with my good friend. A man who is juggling many, many schedules. And a man who likes to read the rule book. Will Everett Human. Will, how you doing? Uh, I don't know anymore, Dan. Yeah, me neither. I'd, if you'd have asked me maybe 48 hours ago, I'd have said I'm alright, but I'm a... Uh... <laughs> I'd, like a lot of hockey fans at the moment, I I just don't know what's going on. No, yeah, that's fine. We'll uh, we'll come to that later. I do have a little question. Nothing nothing too serious, as it'll be the later part of the show. But it is, of course, the end of the decade. Any sort of memories, Will, from from your good self ten years ago? What you're up to? Where you were hockey wise? Any hockey memories you want to share? I only started watching hockey halfway through the decade, so started in 2014. Oh, Closing in on six years with this beloved sport uh, and this beleaguered league. Yeah, what were you doing ten years ago then? Personally, what, what were you doing up to? Ten, ten years ago, I had a very narcissistic thing to say, but unfortunately, it's it's true. I just started the most successful band that I was ever in, and we released wow. our, our demo ten years ago, which is what were you weird. called weird. Uh, we were called Kronos, after the uh, Greek god of space and time, because we were really, really cool. Nice. Had a good little run. Got to play a few shows here, there and everywhere. A few records out. Yeah, it was a good laugh. Um, I was also in a very short-lived band that never recorded a, dem- a demo and maybe only had three practice sessions, but I was in it, so I'm counting that, it just. That's that's good. Am I, am I right in thinking it was a, a, a minor threat tribute band? Close. It's probably more probably more Blink One Eight Two inspired than anything else. Excellent. <laughs> like, like Blink One Eight Two mixed with Champion. <laughs> yeah, we need to be like Blink One Eighty Two, but have like that kind of subtle angst of Nirvana. What do you think? <laughs> Great. Yeah. You and like you and every other five million bands that have just come out this week. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Listen to this for Go a on. great name as Go well. On. We were called. It's really catchy. We were called One Minute Past Five. One minute past five. Why, why one minute past five? Because that was the best time of the day. Because it meant you got to leave work. <laughs> oh, that's excellent. That just shows where our headspace was at the that's time. That's wonderful. I love Isn't it. Isn't that amazing? <laughs> that's really good. That's really deep. But how, how about you, Dad? Where were you ten years ago? Well, uh, you just got married to your wife, didn't you, that year? Or? Yeah, ten, yeah, we'd been married for, at this point, ten years ago. We'd been married for about six months. Uh, we'd been living together for about 12 months, which showed you how quick that happened. Nice, yeah. yeah. And hockey-wise, I was think we just about got to the point where I was able to catch some live... I think some live streams, had, uh, people had started putting games on online. And I just kind of started really watching them properly and really taking a deep interest. Rather than just kind of... I'd had like a casual interest for a few years, but really kind of taken a deep interest and sort of living and dying with my team and everything. So Mm. I don't know though. Like I was trying to think of like hockey highlights from like the last 10 years and everything just goes by so quickly. And I was just, I was thinking before it was not, how long ago was it? Sort of six months ago, the the greatest team probably ever in the regular season was dumped out by a wildcard team in a sweep. And no one's kind of spoken about it ever since. And it was completely insane at the time. But do you, you think about how quickly things move on? <laughs> Obviously, all that's happened in the last 48 hours, which we're going to touch on, has happened. And then that's caused you to forget all about... Not forget all about, but, you know, the the most famous coach in the game got fired from the most high-profile team in the game last week. Yeah. And before that, the other geezer suspended for spitting. I think, not to sound too much like a... Oh, things have changed. Not for the worst, but you know, like everything that we consume is so instant and so short lived nowadays that that's just the nature of the beast. Like to be able to retain, not retain memory, but you know, things don't no, have that's kind of right. for as long as they used to. You know what I mean? Yes, yes. You almost you don't really. I hate the phrase as it means something else, kind of sexual, but you hate <laughs> to kind of you, you don't really soak in the kind of moment anymore you don't breathe it in you just you click on it something happens then you move on to the next thing yeah and it's not and, even yeah, like especially in hockey because it's so obviously you know, there's so many games and so much is always happening that i don't think it's even necessarily a reflection of people and how people consume things nowadays 
because things happen so quickly nowadays that it is just uh you know we're, we're we're almost trained to pick things up and digest it there and then and then put it down because there's something else that's happening instantly after that be it yeah like it's a, a problem it's a problem in every facet of society I, yeah. I can't decide what to watch because there's too much choice i want to watch and this there's thing, always new this stuff thing. coming out or whatever thing. and like you yeah, said and the hockey, next day there's new things to watch and hockey being a great example because like you say there's games every single night and then there's likely something that's going to happen every single night that needs to be talked about and then you get massive things like we've had this week and this month at, at large really where landscape shifting events have happened like you think about you think about last week we were like, God, my my Babcock's been fired. This is this is a big change. Like yo, know, oh, crikey, this is really going to affect the NHL and, and what's going to happen, sort of thing. And now that's yeah. a small fry, absolutely small fry. It's just weird. The way we consume everything is just amped up immeasurably at this point. And the question is, is it going to carry on? Like you think the the tens were were faster than the noughties for sort of growth in technology and then so on and so on back and back and back and are the twenties going to be like i can't envisage how it's going to evolve but yeah i think it's going to change in that way again i mean probably i think we're at the yeah. i think we're at the pinnacle of how we consume news because it's all consumed pretty much nowadays via social media I mean, people still do, but you, you essentially scrolling through Twitter, you'll read a headline and be like, oh, that's terrible. Next thing. Oh, that's funny. Next thing. Oh, that's terrible. Next thing. And you you are consuming it as fast as you can. And then you put your phone down, do something else, and you think, oh, watch some YouTube videos. And you just you just forget. You just, you know, things just disappear out of your brain. The next, so, uh, the think... next development is getting rid of text. We're just going to have pictures for everything. <laughs> there you go. No headlines, just the next thing. The next thing will be, yeah, the next thing will be, it'll be greater recognition of speech. So you don't even have to move your thumbs anymore. You can just sit there and say what you want to happen, which you can kind of do already, but it's not quite perfected yet. Phone, scroll. It'd just be phone, message, you're out tonight, bye. And that'll be it. You just sit there and do it. Can't even use your thumbs anymore, Will. These goddamn millennials. Well, we're gonna we're gonna invent some sort of technology that's gonna supplant the phone for what we need to use our hands for. So yeah, we're gonna have to just yeah voice voice activated phones. I don't know what that technology is gonna be. It's fun. <laughs> just quickly speaking of technology, did you see the uh, Elon Musk Cybertruck <laughs> reveal? <laughs> like what? <laughs> did, didn't the uh, I didn't see the reveal? Didn't like the uh, Windows smash? Yeah, they tried to show how indestructible the windows were by destructing them. <laughs> And they uh, broke. Excellent, as you as you do. <laughs> <laughs> if only you've. Been I mean, to be fair, still going. That's two hundred and fifty quid yeah. on right there. <laughs> to be to be fair to Elon Musk, I, if I was a billionaire, I'd do the same thing. I've invented this thing. Why? I don't know. Why not? I'm rich. I can do whatever I want. I freaking. I felt like it. What was right. his, what's his like, reasoning for why it looks the way it looks? Uh, I think because he's a billionaire and he just felt like it. I guess. The Cybertruck's a bit like the Yeezy Crocs, isn't it? <laughs> Isn't it though? Like it's the same same that's ethos just point. applied to different products. That's true, that's true. Yeah, I was gonna say I don't think we've got time to talk about but I haven't got enough serious in my tank to cover all of the topics we have to cover today, let alone talking about problematic billionaires in society in two thousand nineteen. <laughs> um in, in the in the words of a wise man, Dan, should we start a show? With a big sigh. Yeah, let's Hey everybody, it's that time of the week. It is the smooth recap. Not to be outdone by Marc Andre Fleury, Tukaraz cut his own save of the year candidate as he snags the puck out of the air without the use of a glove. Other goalies not to be outdone are now trying to do even better with some of them stopping pucks using only their testicles. Ever feel like you need a helping hand? A nudge in the right direction? Maybe a little push to help you get the job done? If so, 
Quinn used his new man, as he proved by propelling JT Miller an extra yard to assist him thwart a TJ Oshi breakaway. As I trademarked last week, the New York Islanders' Lego system sets a franchise record with their 17th game in a row with a point. The Calgary Flames have had a terrible week. Following a 5-0 defeat at the hands of the Blues, the Albertan club were forced to spend the night in St. Louis after mechanical issues grounded their team playing. How can it get worse than that? Tyson Barry scored his first goal as a Toronto Maple Leaf this week in his 23rd game. You don't need to be an NHL head coach to work out that maybe playing a player to his strengths was a good idea. Fanatics fans failed to fathom the fabulously framed fashions found fun for Fompany's website. A clerical error led to authentic signed Alex Kafut avalanche jerseys with commemorative embroidery being sold for only $20. Unsurprisingly, the boatload of orders are not being fulfilled. Dougie Hamilton became the first team out to hit 10 goals this season. Reports later serviced that he went on a crazy night out to celebrate which involved going to see a mime, having a drink of water, and then being tucked up in bed by 9.30. James Neal has more goals than any player on the Calgary Flames. How can it get worse than that? Sporting cliches can sometimes be overused, but it was good to see a real-life one play out last night, as a Montreal Canadiens fan literally threw in a towel onto the ice at the end of an 8-1 drubbing by their biggest rivals. The Dallas Stars have followed their torrid 1-7-1 start with a 14-2-1. How can it get better than that? And that was your smooth recap. Did you see the towel come flying on the ice from the Canadians fan? No. <laughs> no, I didn't. No, yeah. So literally, that wasn't a joke. Literally a towel. I, I thought it was a euphemism yeah. from Jersey. Nope. Nope. A literal t- last five seconds, Habs fan came and threw a towel onto the ice. Was it um, in, in Montreal? In, in Montreal. See, that's in Mont- the thing. Yeah, yeah. So, so it's a little known fact that the Bell Centre doubles as a swimming pool during the day. So I think it was probably <laughs> just a set of German tourists trying to get their towel on the, oh, that's uh, cheap. On the sunbed <laughs> for the next so <laughs> Crying on my, uh, Will, my phone's ringing. It's the 1970s. They're saying, can you go back there because you're needed for your jokes. <laughs> yeah, sorry. I'm, you know. I've, I've got an audition for a carry-on film at the end of the week. Yeah. And one other thing. My mother-in-law. Oh, let me tell you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, matron. That, that Quinn Hughes thing was amazing. <laughs> Mate, like, it's so good. It's so good. Especially, like, I can't describe it how you can... Just know that Miller's not going to make it, and he hasn't. He's busted his absolute balls to try and get to to Oshi. Beautiful, just that extra little push and the diving stick lift is oh, beautiful. Like some out of. Uh, did you see? Film, did you see right? the comparison? Did you see the comparison between that and then when it doesn't work? No, I, I can't remember who it was. I, I think it was. It might have been the Red Wings or the Hurricanes or something like that. But the same thing was happening. Of the two defensemen, the one that was behind tried to push the other one with his hand and just pushed him over. <laughs> like, just shoved him to the floor. <laughs> Chin first into the eyes, broke four teeth. Yeah. <laughs> See, sometimes it doesn't work, which is why it was even more impressive when Quinn Hughes did it. Yes, yeah, right. that was the trick, just using the blade of the stick. Oh, yeah, clever. just a gentle, just gently, just gently. That's all you need, just a bit God. more. Okay. Um, who's winning the cup this week? Uh, Zach Cassian's going to win the cup, because... <laughs> Because he's got bloody 18 points in 26 games. <laughs> <laughs> I don't, who's to say how that's happened, really? I mean, we'll, Who we'll knows? never know. We'll, we'll never no, know. I think there's, a, there's a team of scientists working on that right now, I think. It's, I, was, I was looking at his, sort of, uh, his splits on uh, natural statue just to see, oh, well, you know, 15 of those have got to be secondary assists or whatever, but... Yeah, the majority of his assists are secondary, but he's got, what, three primary assists and eight goals, I think. So he's still doing really well. <laughs> or, like, he's playing effectively on that line, so that's not going to end well for the Oilers, though, is it? <laughs> <laughs> no. Zach Cassian's in, been in signed to a six-year, $4 million a season contract. Well, the Teflon Don isn't there anymore to hand out these contracts, so they might be all right. God, mate, you say that as if the Teflon Don's the only idiot in the NHL. Fantastic point. 
In the same vein as players performing, winning the cup for me this week is Jean-Gabriel Pajot, who, since November the 1st, only two players have scored more goals than him, which is Conor McDavid and David Pasternak. Really? And he's in a, con- and he's in a contract year. How many years What a better since... time. I think he's got 11, 10 or 11, since November the 1st. Jesus Christ. Well, he's not yeah. going to score a goal for the rest of the year now. Probably not. But he's done enough to earn that nice big fat contract. Still great, great November. Great November. <laughs> he's gonna yeah, maybe it's like yeah, like Patrick. Like, Patrick I was gonna Lainer, say he's gonna use Patrick Line as a as a as a contract comparable. <laughs> as his comparable. <laughs> I'm, I'm basically oh, the second coming of Patrick Line. <laughs> and I'm not even oh, gonna go mate. off in a huff. He went off in a huff. I deserve at least six million just for being a good just for being a decent player and a good teammate. Just uh, just for being nice. I love Canadians, so I get more money anyway. Yeah, exactly. Um, who's getting relegated? Uh, Adrian Data is getting relegated. Finally, Dan, do you, uh, do you do you know much on Adrian Data? Uh, I've heard the name, but please do enlighten me. Well, Adrian Data is a prick, and he writes f- uh, about the Avalanche. <laughs> he, I can't remember what publication he's writing for now, and I couldn't actually care less. He um he was the guy last year, if you remember. I'm trying to remember who he was picking a fight with. He was having an argument with uh, an Avs blogger on Twitter. Basically saying, oh, you bloggers go back to your mum's basement and all that. You, know, you shouldn't be in the press box and all that. And then he offered the geezer out, like talking about uh, the hockey code and stuff like that. Oh, no, no, no. He was, he's the guy who said, MMA fighting's legal. I'll kill you or something like that. So there's... <laughs> other blogger, and, uh, I remember, yeah, I remember that guy. Now. Yeah, that's that's who Adrian Data is, and uh, and this oh week he's, he said to Scott Cullen, former TSN general, nice guy and good content guy, Scott Cullen, he said after Cullen said, "Oh, I wish I was as calm and cool on Twitter as you are." To Adrian Data, he said, "Unfollow me then, just like I did with you. Mind your own fucking business." So Adrian Data, <laughs> chill the fuck out and fuck the fuck off. Christ, do you reckon he has a bad home, he has a bad home life or something? Do you reckon his missus is just constantly on him all the time? Do you have to take it out on other people? I hope she is because it sounds like he deserves it. Yeah, good point. Yeah, keep going, Mrs. Data, if that even is your real name. I wish it. Well, uh, uh, yeah, I wish him all the unhappiness in the world. Who are you going to relegate? <laughs> Unfortunately, well, I've got to relegate somebody you love. I'm going to relegate John Klingberg. Oh, um, mate, you can't do that. Why? He was the head of four assists night the other night. It's my show, I can do whatever we want. Yeah, fair enough. A lot of players are asked about what would you call the Seattle team, the Seattle whatever. And there weren't there were some bad answers, I'll be honest, but John Klingberg's was I would call them the Seattle Pigeons. <laughs> <laughs> now That's good. I wanna say I wanna say this is lost in translation, but it isn't. And I just feel that if you're gonna name yourself after any kind of bird Something that's more commonly referred to sometimes as the rat of the sky would not be the best choice. I, I think that's unfair. Pigeons aren't the rat of the sky, they're the rat of the ground too. I think pigeons are a good sort of <laughs> subversive name for a hockey team. Pigeons. You get a lot of pigeons in Seattle, don't you? Yeah, it's like, uh, it's like calling... Yeah, I don't know, I haven't got a good example for you. Yeah, no, I know, I get it, you're trying to defend your boy, and I appreciate the effort, Will, but yeah, sorry. I, I He's tried, out to lunch here. I tried my hardest. Is there a worse animal you could name a team after? Oh, there are plenty of worse animals. Like, like? What, have, what have you called um, Seattle eels? <laughs> the eels Seattle, is fine. The Seattle jelly deals. <laughs> jelly deal is a food. Oh well, yeah, but not eels. a type of animal. Eels though. What else can we? Yeah, but you can't. Yeah, but see, an eel can be electrified, Mate, which e- is kind of cool. Eels, are, no, but yeah, I'm talking just straight normal eel, and you can't tell me that's any worse, better than pigeons. No, pigeons is worse. At least pigeons is a better sounding word than eels. The Seattle eels. <laughs> no, the Seattle eels sounds better than the Seattle pigeons. <laughs> the Seattle eels. I think. The Seattle eels. I think, I think you're off your nut. All right, what, what else? <laughs> what else is worse? No, on, I want you to I'm get not, me one that I'm I go, not, all right, yeah, you're right. I'm not going to perpetuate your, your hatred of pigeons. Eel, eels <laughs> is the answer, Dan, and you know that eels is a worse name. <laughs> Than pigeons. And we need to stop talking about eels before I break into some sort of null fielding eels. <laughs> yeah, some kind of we get into stuck in some kind of Howard Hughes bloody repeating the same thing over and over again issue. How many starters and scratches do you have? Uh, I've got two starters and 
No scratches. Zero. Bobkiss. An interesting week to pick no scratches, Will. <laughs> well, I'll tell you for why when it comes to the scratches round. Okay, okay, okay. Uh, I've got three starters and one scratch, Ooh, so nice. I shall start first. Start with the starters. Uh, did you see the Sharks Islanders intermission with the uh, the shootout and the young boy who did the spinorama? Um, yes, I saw the spinorama. And then did you also see the moonwalk celebration? Oh, shit, yeah, I did. Yeah, that was good. That was a good... Uh... Fantastic. Do you know what? When I was that age, when I was that age, I would never, ever, ever have dreamed of doing anything like that. I would have just gone down, had my shot, skated back. This kid's <laughs> yeah. going to go places, I'm telling you. Pulling out a spinorama in a national arena and then doing a fucking moonwalk. Fair you, play. You almost sounded like 200 hockey men there. Like, oh, when I was this age, I would have never dreamed of doing something like that. Oh, sorry, yeah, to clarify... Not dreamed of it because I would have thought it was Billy Big shit, because I was too scared. <laughs> Nothing to do with like thinking <laughs> it's I wrong. I didn't have the balls, the that's why. <laughs> I would have wanted to do it, but I would have been too nervous and like, oh no, I can't. Oh, what if someone shouts at me? I'd have been too scared to do it, that's why. You can just tell that that 10-year-old boy is bad in the room. <laughs> <laughs> he's, he's, he's got no jam, has he? He's a distraction to the team, it's quite clear. He's a massive distraction. Yeah, they've got to trade him, to be honest. He's a massive distraction. I've heard he's holding out for a new contract as well. It's a, it's, it's a shambles. Set, send him down to the midget equivalent of the ECHL is. Well, no, it'd be like, if he's in the under-13s, it'd be the under-12s. He's got to go and play with the 10-year-olds now for a bit. Learn some humility. <laughs> wonder, like a conditioning God. stint. We're sending you down to the under eights <laughs> for a conditioning stint. There's like a 14-year-old kid. <laughs> oh, dear. All right, what's your first start? Uh, my first start is going to be Eddie Lack. Have you seen the tweet that Eddie Lack has, has popped out regarding... Um, well, a potential situation. I have not. It was in Swedish to, uh, in response to Linus Hugesson, who I believe is a, a hockey reporter in, in native Sweden. Uh, I won't read the Swedish because I can't read speed it Swedish, but I'll I'll read the translate. Hugesson's talking about the uh, the Bill Peters situation. He mentioned the possibility of Babcock going to the Flames because he's an Alberta boy and stuff like that, potentially replacing Bill Peters. And Eddie Lack said... Yeah. Uh, if Babcock comes into the flames right after this, we might as well put the sport down. Was, oh. oh, wow! Eddie Black, love you. We love you so much, Big Eddie. Yeah, he speaks the truth. Yeah, couldn't agree more. That's... Like I said before, the times are a changing. Players are now speaking their minds, and that's a, that's a good thing. That's what we like to hear. What we like to hear, and what we like to see. My next starter, I'm going to start Keith Yandel. He is the uh, the current Iron Man. <laughs> And he loses nine teeth in the first period against the Sabres after taking a puck to the to the mush. So he misses the second period, getting himself patched up, comes back out for the first. They're in a back-to-back, so to keep his Ironman streak going, he goes to the dentist in the morning and then suits up at five the same day to keep his streak going. Is it stupidity? Yeah, kind of. But do I respect it? Yeah, kind of. Yeah. I, I remember reading a, an article, I forget where it was, I think it was on the Players' Tribune. It was about a, a a team dentist or a team doctor. Yes, yes, I saw that one about that. It was only, it was only like a few months ago, wasn't it? Oh no, this one was donkey's years ago. Like ah, uh, okay, okay, two, it's a recent one, as three well. years ago. Uh, okay, this, this guy was talking about um, a player took a high stick, and yeah, lost a couple of teeth. So they were like taking out the fragments of teeth, and then he was like chiseling away or whatever, and it's like. Oh, what's this big black bit in this guy's gum? So it's like chiseling, chiseling, chiseling. And he realised it was like a two inch long bit of composite stick that had wedged no. into the guy's gum from the high stick. And it's like, oh my God. Just Jesus horrendous. Christ. Absolutely horrendous. Any, um, any amateur hockey players, be it roller, ice, whatever it might be, put a cage on. Put a cage on, mate. <laughs> if you're not yeah, wearing a cage... It don't because you think you look hard, you're a mug. We've all got work the next day, generally, or what? Yo, know, we've all got lives to live. No, no one, no one out there is getting paying you to play amateur hockey. Don't take your your livelihood <laughs> into your own hands for the sake of fashion. Jesus, put a bloody cage on people, bloody hell. And your last one? Uh, my last one is uh, a bit of a serious one, Dan. A bit of a serious one. I'm going to start Akim Alu, Michael Jordan, Dan Costello, and anyone else who has come forward over the last day or so uh, regarding the Bill Peters and NHL culture at large 
situation the immense immense props to 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 the people who have come forward with their true stories and anyone who's supporting them in in and around the league and the sport because it's it's an important time it's a very important time and now we must as as a whole we have to do the right thing we have to put history behind us and we have to put expectations of of hockey culture and the sport or the history of the nhl behind us and do the right thing and affect change in the league and uh this speech will continue in probably five ten minutes my last starter is i'm going to credit robert's <laughs> Well, where do I go from I hope, there? I hope this is... I'm, I'm really open. My last starter is uh, Orville, the green Beans. puppet. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Well, no, it's something silly, because uh, it has to be. Cause, it's you know, like I say, yeah. Where do we go from there? My last starter is... Uh, I have to credit Robert Söderlund of At Hockey Webcast, who shared a video of... I'm not sure if you saw this, of Patrick Zakrissen in the SHL. Yeah. who the, the, his, team, his team had clearly lost a game. So this is I love this video because it just epitomizes everything that is man. Yes, so, yeah, I've seen this one. Yeah. Okay, so if you've not seen it, folks, you've got to try and find it, but I'll quickly describe it. Locker room, end of the game, his team's clearly lost. Patrick is clearly frustrated. He throws his jersey into the uh, into the trolley where this obviously gonna be taken away to be cleaned. He then flips the trolley in frustration, just like launches it. All the dirty gear comes flying out. For a second, he thinks, oh, you twat, someone's got to pick that up. I'll pick it up. So he picks it all up, does the right thing, puts it back in the trolley. Then as he's, as he's walking back to his to his stall, he sees like a, it looks like a stand with kind of drinks in and stuff, and he just puts his foot right through it, making even more of a mess that he just cleaned up. It's such a man thing to do. It's brilliant. Oh, I got I laugh so hard. I do, I've done this plenty of times. I've done this plenty of times. I get frustrated. I either hit something or have a little rage out and think, God, why did you do that? You're such an idiot. But then for some reason, something niggles me and it comes back and then I get even more angry. It's, it's that instant regret and shame and remorse of, oh, I shouldn't have done that. Oh, I'm better than that. I shouldn't have. <laughs> oh, I'm an idiot. And then you, you go into that internal mo- monologue of, oh, look what you've done, you stupid twat. The best thing was, though, like I said, yeah, he does that. So he has the... Oh, Patrick, yeah, you fucking dick. And he's like, nah, fuck Someone's it. got to clean that up. I'd better pick it up. I'd better p- I'll pick it up. I'll pick it up. He picks it up, and then as he's walking away, he goes, oh, no, fuck it. <laughs> just kicks the, just kicks the <gasps> drink stand I over. shouldn't have to pick it up. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's the best. He trashes the place, cleans it, and then trashes it even more. Great stuff. So no scratches. Why Why no scratches, Well, Because it's, it's a serious time, Dan. Like, we're meant to make fun of bad things and scratch bad things and and have a laugh of it and i don't i feel i've had all the humor rightfully sucked out of me in the last 24 hours and don't say what i know you're thinking of saying i have no idea what you're talking about will <laughs> i'm not i'm not doing this okay go on i'll, I'll, I'll give I, I, I'll, I'll give you one funny scratch go on i'll give you one funny scratch um i'm going to scratch my daughter for uh saying to the her like lead worker at nursery today uh, I love penises. <laughs> <laughs> Which led to, to me having to have a very awkward conversation with the manager. <laughs> oh, fantastic. Shout out to kids and their delightfully blissful, ignorant, rampaging, bull-like truth that they just spew out whenever it's, they so feel it's like beautiful. it. beautiful. We, fantastic. We just thought we'd let you know. There's nothing wrong, nothing wrong. We just thought you'd want to know. Excellent. Absolutely excellent. So... So your daughter's three? Nah, two and a half. Two and a half on the nose. She's two and a half. So at two and a half years old, you're already being called into the headmaster's office, Will. Damn. <laughs> it's a rough know, it's road good, ahead, it's mate. It's a good start. It's a good start. Yeah, good start. Rough road. Well, I've told you, didn't I, that George's first swear word was cunt, which she just came out with. <laughs> just came out with my ass. Dude, I told you before, I have no idea where she got that word from. I mean, clearly I've said it. I've said it on this show. But I'm, you've got, clear, you've I'm said fairly it sure. I've ten seconds ago, never said it around her. Yeah, I never said it around her. That was her first. She just walked we'll, we'll yeah. in, mate. She's upstairs sleeping now, and sublim- subliminally, it's coming in. She's going to wake up and in. say, "Daddy, who's Adrian Data?" <laughs> anyway, my scratch is I'm going to scratch four goal leads. Well, as for the fifth time this season, a four goal lead was erased, and the team that lost the four goal lead went on to lose. It appears that no lead is safe at all. Not even four goals. Well, the four goals is... Four goals, not... It's a new two goals, isn't it? 
Yeah, four goals is the new two. Like you say, well, we we just said at the start of the show, everything's getting even quicker now. Soon, <laughs> eight goals will be the new four goals, and you know, then no, nothing's ever, no lead is ever safe. That's the problem. That's the problem. Kids want increased scoring, but at what cost? I know, ridiculous. A four goal lead isn't safe anymore. Jesus Christ! Back in my day, four goal leads were safe. Ah, oh, four goal lead meant something. We respected a four goal lead. <laughs> These millennials coming in here. All right. Before we move on to the obvious news, we are on Spotify, iTunes, Google Podcasts, YouTube, and everywhere else that sound is produced. If you want to be a little cheeky scamster and leave a five-star review on iTunes, then that'd be great. Thank you very much. Wait, and... When you say everywhere that sound's produced, and does that cover like those little cardboard books you get for kids where like you, there's the button down the side with the speaker? It's got like you press the cow and it goes moo, and you press the pig and it goes oink. Do we have a version of that? Yeah. Yeah, because if you look, there'll be somewhere in that book a little flag or a little puck or a little hockey stick. And if you push it, it just plays the latest episode. <laughs> so, yeah, that, it's, in, it's in those as well. It's really clever. <laughs> They're very clever. All right, here's the second part of you. Here he is, Ken Dyson. Are there people in Montreal then who that refuse to speak English in any way? Are they, and is that how they sort of represent like Quebec? And do they, you know, is that, does that happen? You know what? I'm pretty sure it does happen because everything happens, but um, I don't really see it. I don't really see <laughs> oh, okay. it. Okay. You know, okay. like, I mean, we have like different neighborhoods. Like, I live in the West End of Montreal, like, um, but, you know, close to downtown. And you can speak English and French. It doesn't really matter. Usually what I speak is franglais, which is uh, a mixture of French and English. <laughs> you just throw yes. in different yeah. words. Uh, just as long as you get, you know, your point across. I um, mean, my French is far from perfect. I understand it quite well, but um, speaking it involves a, a lot of brain power, which gives me headaches. But, uh, <laughs> but yeah, no, I've really never go- come into, especially recently, I've never come into any like antagonistic thing where it's like, oh, you have to speak in, you have to speak to me in French, or uh, I'm not going to serve you, or okay, whatever. You know, it's it's. I think it's it's chill. It's chilled out. You know, um, and I think. It has to do with, you know, like this new millennial attitude of like, I mean, I mean, I guess a lot of it is just capitalism. People just want to make money and they're not going to make money if you're just speaking French. No, that's true. Yeah. You know, unfortunately has, <laughs> but, um, but yeah, so that's, I mean, and you know, like all the media we get, I mean, there, there is like a, a little sub industry of of French entertainment or whatever, you know, like uh, media culture or whatever. But most okay. of it, most of it is just, you know, Hollywood stuff. Like, I mean, we go like, you know, everyone watches like all the Marvel Universe movies and I'm pretty sure most of them don't go to the French dub versions. You know, I mean, oh, yeah, of course, yeah. you know, everyone wants to be part of the global conversation. And for that, like it, unfortunately, you know, for what for whatever it's worth right now, that's English. I mean, given a few more years, it'll probably be Mandarin. But as we are right now, I mean, the common language is English. I mean, even in the locker room. So if you have like a, a French Canadian coach, he's speaking to his players in English, whether they come from Finland or the Czech Republic or whatever. Yeah, of course. They're all speaking in English. That's I, I don't know. I just think that's the situation right now. And yeah, I don't really see that much antagonism. You know, there was back in the 70s, there was like riots and stuff, but uh, that stuff is all calmed down. Okay, okay. Little tiny side story. I did try and learn Cantonese when I was going out with my uh, my ex was Chinese, and I tried to learn it. And oh my yeah. god, it's. <laughs> I mean, if we are going to have to start learning Mandarin, it's got to be out of the womb, essentially, yeah. because it is insanely difficult to learn. I bet. I because it's all try. it's all in tone, so okay, you'll have yeah. a you'll have like you can have the same word you can have the same word spelled the same way four times, but it will mean completely. That's why it's the classic joke of. Oh, what did you say? And then, you know, the joke is, oh, I said something really insulting or something like that. But mm-hmm. it's just, yeah, it's either like your tone goes up and down, down and up, stays flat, or starts up, goes down, then goes up. Oh, and okay. They're, they're, it's all tone, and it's, yeah. It's so you got to kind of sing it in a certain way. Yes. It's, yeah. when, when, when I first started learning it, the person who was teaching me said, you have to go, you have to do it slowly. So you have to kind of go, ah, like that, and that'll be the word. Or the next one will be, ah. <laughs> and then do it very, very slowly. And then as you get better and better, you're, and I was like, okay, this is ridiculous. Yeah, forget know. about it. <laughs> yeah, forget it. 
<laughs> yeah, it'd be probably faster to invent a universal translator you can stick in here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Do Montreal fans, I've got to ask this, do they hate the Bruins more or the Leafs more? Oh, they hate the Bruins more. I think oh, hands, okay, okay. hands down. I think the thing, the deal with the, the Maple Leafs is we can't hate them because they always lose. <laughs> it's hard. To, it's really hard Ricochet to hate someone shot. who always loses. It's just, can't do it. But we love the fact that they lose. Like that gives us a lot of pride. <laughs> <laughs> I relish in the fact they lose, but I I'd like to see them win at some point. It you know, but then but when they win, they're like so smug. <laughs> it drives me crazy. Like the fact the Raptors won. Well, they are, they are Canada's bas- they are uh, Canada's, Canada's basketball, basketball team. team. Yeah, yes, of course. Of course. <laughs> but the point is, like, you, you see what the the Canadian media shows you of the Maple Leafs now that they haven't won anything since 1967. Can you imagine if they win the Stanley Cup? Please. So, what? How is the media coverage then? So, for example, last season the Bruins made the Cup final. What's the media coverage like of hockey then? When if the Canadians are not in the in the playoffs or anything like, does it die down, or are they just talking about the Canadians still, or are they still covering the playoffs? What happened? Uh, okay, well, I I, did, I don't really pay that didn't pay that much attention last year, but okay. um, I mean, I do I do listen to the like the the talk radio um, oftentimes when I'm like stuck in my car driving around, and uh, you know they still they talk about the series that's going on. Like um, I think. There's there's a good core of hockey fans here that are just fans of the sport itself and yeah so no we're not talking about the Canadians during you know while the while the while the Bruins are playing the Blues in yeah. the final we're talking about that final and uh, and I was rooting for the Blues but uh... you sh- yeah as you should be <laughs> you should be doing that as a uh, as a Montreal fan I would expect yeah. nothing less so in that case then yeah I guess we can quickly uh, talk about last night did you. Oh Zid- yes, Zid- Zid- yeah, Zdeno Chara gets a a round of applause from the fans there. That his, surprised um... me. Oh my gosh! Do you know what it was? I and I I think I put this on Twitter today, but I think it showed that throughout everything is that Montreal is a hockey town, and they respect good, decent hockey players who play the game hard and yeah. respect the sport and. I, yeah, I, I think that's what it but was. It, what's really funny is, though, um, I think this might have been mentioned on the radio today, so I don't want to take credit for remembering this on my own, but I think the last time that Zdeno Chara got a standing ovation at the Bell Center was when he got hit in the face with a puck. <laughs> so, <laughs> so to me, the fact that they gave him, I don't know, it just it's just weird, like, I know he's a pretty dirty player, I think. But as I don't, let's not get into that. But you know, like it, it stemmed, I guess, back from the Pacioretty uh, incident when he yes. uh, head yes. butted him into, or he stuck his head into the stanchion. And I don't think he purposely stuck his head in a stanchion. I really don't think he tried to decapitate the guy. Like, but afterwards, when he was saying that he didn't know that Pacioretty was even on the ice, that I think is complete BS. Because you know, like even in you know my son's bantam league, you know who's on the ice at all times because you know you're yeah. following. Like you know, number sixty-seven is like one of their top scorers. You're gonna know he's on the ice at whatever, at any given time. Uh, so the, he could have said, "Yeah, you know, I tried to hit him. Unfortunately, it wasn't at the right place of the ice." But anyway, I mean, but hockey is that. It's a brutal sport, and those incidents are gonna happen. You know, you can't take them out of the game. It's it's a shame, but yeah, I was really so I was actually quite surprised they gave him that they that the Habs even did that announcement. I was pretty surprised by. And yeah, I, I was very surprised. Yeah, so I guess good think, on good on them, I guess for for taking the high road on it. Do you think because do you think because it happened because the rivalry isn't really? I've said this before. Is that to me the rivalry just isn't really there at the moment because, yeah. like the obviously the Canadians have been on the downswing and they're now only just starting to kind of turn back up and looking better. Yeah, um, we need another. Why? We need another playoff series, big time. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the history between the Canadians and the Bruins in the playoffs. I mean, that's that's you know that's like my childhood. Like that's what it's yeah. to me. That's what it's all about. Like just beating the big bad Bruins and now the Bruins aren't really big bad anymore they're actually just good good I mean there was like the because yeah. t- the Canadians and the Bruins like when I was growing up like uh, sort of late 70s early 80s it was like a clash of styles right like the yes. the, the 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 Bruins were like the lunch pail you know uh 
Johnny Worker guys and, uh, you know, big and tough. You know, I mean, you had some skill as well. And then the Canadians were the flying, flying Frenchman type run and gun style. It was fun to see the two, the two different styles clash. But now I think the styles in the NHL, like there's so much, you know, analytics done and uh, the tactics are getting to be a lot like, you know, teams are becoming more similar than they used yes. to be in the past. So, uh, yeah, so maybe that's part of why the rivalry is not quite there anymore. Uh, the fact that the Canadians haven't won in so long doesn't doesn't help. <laughs> well, one good one good playoff series will change that because, like, even if you look at the Knights and the Sharks, yeah, and that's like that's now. Oh my God, that's front, the best. Like, yeah, that's now like <laughs> the rivalry in the game at the moment. You've got preseason game, Arundel hip checking Mark yeah. Stone and stuff in a preseason yeah. game. Like, yeah. what are we? Like, wow, you guys really hate each other already. This is great. So yeah, I think one playoff series would change that, and it would uh, it would all come rushing back, and then we'd have to and then obviously we'd have to hate each other, but that's fine. Yeah, yeah, no, that's fine. We can I can do hate. Yeah. <laughs> uh. So I wanted to talk to you then about being a, a hockey parent. Yeah. What goes into, because you hear that obviously it's a very tough sport to get into. It costs lots of money. <sighs> it's travel. It's all this crazy schedule, even for like, you know, like the kids are like six, seven, eight. What's your schedule like around like your kids playing hockey? Uh, well, you know, it's, it's, uh, yeah, it takes up a lot of time. Uh, yeah. So he's a goalie too. So to top it all off. Oh, okay. So I think you, you mentioned that you played goal too, or is that Will? I forget. I did. Well, did I, you not play in ice hockey? But I played I like played in soccer or whatever. Soccer yeah. and field hockey. Yeah, but I, I am okay. A, so I am a goalie by heart. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So me too. I played goalie as uh, in soccer. My dad was also a goalie. No and, way. Uh, yeah. And so I fantastic. D- yeah. <laughs> I didn't play goalie in hockey because it was too expensive to be goalie in hockey, <laughs> and I, uh, okay. uh, I I didn't um, I didn't pester my dad enough to allow me to to let me do it. And then when I turned like. 14 or 15 and body checking became a thing i was not interested anymore so So, but my son pestered me enough and so he's a goalie and so i've learned how to find secondhand equipment and all of that kind of stuff but to be a goalie now is not just you strap on the pads and you flop around and stop a puck it's uh it's an intense uh, amount of uh technical stuff you gotta learn it's like it's it's like learning a uh, like a martial art or something so he goes to see a goalie coach once a week, and then he has practice for his team twice a week and probably two games a week. And then on top of that, he's uh, really into drawing, which I probably will end up being his career. So he t- has two art classes a week. So I'm it, so like yesterday we were supposed to meet, but then it's like, oh, I had to bring him to drawing class. And then so I got to watch two periods of, well a period and a half because that second period last night took forever i don't know what was going yeah on. yeah but I, I watched a period and a half at a french sports bar and then jumped back in the car <laughs> picked him up and we listened and then we watched the third period together at home oh, okay so yeah so that's why i couldn't uh, i couldn't meet you yesterday <laughs> no it's fine and uh, today he's got a uh, one of those rare day offs but yeah so it does it takes quite a bit of time and he's he doesn't play at the the highest level so there's um the highest level to play is triple A, and then there's a double A, and then there's a double B. So he plays a double B. So he plays at a relatively high level. So uh, he takes it seriously, and he loves it. And if he didn't love it, I would be fine with him not playing it. But he tells me after every game that he loves it, uh, although games that he loses, he's a little quieter. <laughs> so, <laughs> but yeah, no, so he, he, he loves playing, so I'm um, cool with that. And I, I, I really think a sport is um, an important thing in someone's development to get uh, to learn teamwork, to learn that yes. you have to work hard and other people rely on you, especially as a goalie. Uh, you're like the last line of defense. If you make a mistake, there's a goal. So you have to have also a certain amount of uh, letting the water run off your back, right? Absolutely. So that's something that I didn't take too well. So I quit at a, a much earlier age than he did. Even as a soccer goalie, I was like, I can't handle this. <laughs> um, but he's got he's got a lot of uh, more strength of character uh, for that kind of stuff than I ever did. He's super calm about it. And so, yeah, so it does take – so paying for the goalie coach and then paying for hockey. And in Quebec, it's not – well, I don't know if it's all over Quebec, but in Montreal, it's a lot cheaper than, say, in Toronto because I was – there was like this Twitter poll going on, going out, like, you know, how much do you guys play for hockey? Like why is it so prohibitive for people, you know, uh, lower-income people to play hockey? And the prices to play hockey in Toronto, I – like my eyes bulged out of my head. I was like there's no way that he could play even house league. 
if I live in Toronto. But in Montreal, the the, the city subsidizes uh, uh, arenas. Okay. So the so the hockey teams don't have to pay for the arenas. So the arena oh, cost cool. is like I guess I pay for it in my taxes, but <laughs> but that's fine. <laughs> that's fine. It's uh you know it's all good. So uh yeah. So the kids get so we get. So even at his his level, I mean, if he played AAA, I probably would have to take a second mortgage out of my house. Oh so my we'll God. so we'll see whether he um he wants to try it because the next level is is uh he's fourteen now, so it will be in midget, and at uh, midget it gets like super serial. So if you make midget AAA, then the junior teams start to scout. So we'll see. Well, I guess you know in four or five years when Jeff Merrick's doing his, his prospect draft and all that kind yeah, of thing, I'll, right. we'll have to we'll look, look, out look, out look out for the Dyson. But <laughs> yeah, uh, look out for the Dyson. <laughs> but yeah, no, I like the, the, that's the other thing is that you hang around parents who think their kid's going to make it in the NHL. That's the, Oh <laughs> uh, yeah. Those parents are the worst. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so, I mean, I know there's like a one in like maybe a million chance and that's even if he wants it. I mean, the amount of sacrifice you have to do, you know, the payoff's got to be worth it. So, I mean, I'd be happy. To, for me, like when I talk to him, like why you have to improve and, and get better, it's not because you want to make the NHL. It's because if when you end up, you know, being uh, my age or probably a little younger and um, you want to join a rec league or your, your office, like, you know, uh, wants to have a, a hockey team, you don't want to suck. Right. Yeah. You don't <laughs> want to go in guy, there. And, and especially if you're the goalie, everybody needs a goalie. So it's like, just be a good goalie. And then, you know, like when you're in the beer league, you'll be the good goalie and you won't have to pay the entrance fees because, you know, they'll appreciate it. So, yeah. So, I mean, was, the thing is, but, you know, my attitude is if you're going to try to do something, don't suck at it. So, you know, work your work your tail off until it's, you know, until you don't want to do it anymore. And then at that point, just say, OK, I don't want to do it anymore. And then, you know, there's no point in half assing something. That was part of the reason what drew me to being a goalie in soccer was that nobody else wanted to do it. Yeah. And I just had this weird compulsion, like, <laughs> maybe I'll do it then. OK, I'll give it a shot. And I just, yeah, just fell in love with it. Also, it's a good life skill. It's learning to lose. As yeah. Well, yeah. Because you will get scored on. To me, a goalie is the best position to learn any kind of life lesson through sports because you are go- there's points where you will lose a, a, a one-on-one duel, so to speak. It's you versus the attacker, yeah. and they will score past you at some point. Right. You know, you, you're never going to save every single shot. So I, I think that's the best position to play in any sport involving a goal. Because, yeah, yeah, yeah. And the weird thing is that you're completely – I mean you're completely different from any other players. Like, So you have forwards and you have defensemen and you have whatever, centers and wingers, and they're all different positions. But they're all in the same universe, right? Yeah. But the goalie is in a completely different universe. The goalie does not dictate any of the play. The goalie reacts to – everything else that happens and so uh yeah it's just a it's a completely different mindset i was talking to um, obviously yeah, i spoke to uh, paul campbell from um exactly oh Europe. yeah, yeah he's, about, he's great about being a goalie and what it is to be a goalie and why it's such a a kind of strange thing you don't really take part in the same practice because yeah everyone else's everyone else's objective is different to yours exactly and every you it's always you versus even in practice, you yeah. you always play against other people because it's your own team. Yeah, 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 practice. yeah, yeah. You, you kind of you kind of have to form like an island, and then to, like you say, to to kind of develop that strength of character, to be in the headspace, to just be like, all right, all right, I'll let that one go. Fine, let's move on. Yeah, it's a it's definitely a good life skill to have. Yeah, and it's cool. Like at his level, right? So they have two goalies a team. So you know, you play every other game. And uh, sometimes you go in if the other guy's having a bad night, you know, so you have someone that you can commiserate with and there's there's someone that you can relate to that's on the team. Like you're not completely alone, but at the same time, like the the two, it's true. Like when when they're at a team practice, it's like basically they're just another prop to the rest of the team. Like they don't have a they don't have a goalie coach, you know, for the team. And this is this, this is probably something that if you have Paul on again, you can talk to him about the fact that. Canada doesn't produce a lot of great goalies anymore. I mean, they, I mean, well, there's Carey Price and Carter Hart, I guess, but you know, like a a country like Finland, which is like probably has the population of Montreal, like, I don't know, produced so many great goalies in the late nineties and the two thousands. And I think one of the reason is, is how they select their, their, uh, their players. Like, so like right now, like if you, if you're like eight years or if you're like seven or eight years old, the 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 goalie dad was probably was most likely the you know the wealthiest one on the on the on the team will buy <laughs> his kid like all this goalie gear all brand new or whatever and it's like this is the goalie and he's got like no instruction 
and doesn't know if he even wants to be a goalie at seven years old. I mean, who knows what they want at seven years old, whether they have an aptitude for it. And then because of, I guess, force of habit, they end up being the goalie the rest of their playing career. Whereas in Finland, they don't let anybody be a goalie until I think they're 12. Everybody rotates. Maybe it's 10, but they rotate and everybody plays goalie at one point during the year. And then you find out oh, that you okay. find the kid that's like, I really love this, right? And you're like, well, you know, you still got to work on your skating and your stick handling. So you have goalies that can skate, that can stick handle, that can shoot, and then also really like being goalie and have an aptitude for it. And I, if we would uh, if we would adopt that here, I think we would have a killer crop of goalies within 10 years. But Hockey Canada is Hockey Canada. so <laughs> Yes, that's true. <laughs> Mentioning Carey Price, then I've got to ask you as a as a as a Habs fan this uh, this contract of his. Oh. <laughs> so I've I've asked people this before. I but hate I'm going to ask this you question. A, yeah, go for uh, it. Sorry, as an actual Habs fan, I need to ask you this: His agent, you're, you're Mark Bergevin. You've just finished picking up a cow and then eating it because yeah. you know you're a giant. You're a giant, <laughs> right? And his agent comes in and says, "Carey wants ten and a half million a year." Yeah. What What would you do? At that point that that happened or like yeah. now, like it happens now because – No, no. no at that he, point, he, yeah. I, when you know, done. I love Carey Price. I think he is probably the best goalie of this generation. But I would have balked on that. I would have said sorry yeah. because I think in the NHL – and this is why I hate the fact that there's so much money and there's a salary cap because without a salary cap, you could have your $10.5 million goalie and you could also get a center or a left D, <laughs> two things that we didn't have when they signed <laughs> Harry Price for $10 million. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, so as heartbreaking as it would be, I think that was a mistake. And I think Harry Price is the best goalie, but I don't think the team needs the best goalie to win. No. I think you, you need, need, you need a good goalie. Yeah, you know? decent. A decent goalie. I mean, the Bruins, I think, have the perfect situation right now with Halak and Rask. I think they're both good goalies. They can share the the you know they share the the thing and they don't make that much money. Well, it's the the crazy thing I think is now is that we're seeing a, a kind of evolution is that the backup is now way more important than it used oh, to be. Yeah, yeah, is that for the longest time? Like, I mean, Rask was just you talk about sort of the pressure from Montreal media and that like the the, the amount of shit he gets to Rask, it's insane from the Bruins fans, oh, yeah? Bruins and media. I mean, honestly, it's. You would think he was, I don't know, you would think he was just some rookie playing in his first game, the way they talk about, oh my God, trade him, he's terrible, blah, blah, blah. I mean, even after the, like the 2013 postseason when they lost to the Blackhawks, statistically, he was better that, that postseason mm-hmm. than the Tim Thomas postseason when they won the Oh yeah, really? Won the huh. <laughs> so like, and, and still, people like doubt his ability. And then last season, he did it again. And even in the cup final, like those four goals, he got left out to dry completely yeah. on each one of those goals. It wouldn't, and they only made the final because like he stole games in that postseason run. Yeah. But then it showed that actually, if you've got, if you've got a, a competent backup, a guy who can come in, maybe win you half of his games, that's fine. Yeah. Do a good job. Give your first guy a rest. He can then play better. Same with uh, Ben Bishop and Hudobin, yeah. obviously in, in Dallas. It, you know they did the same thing, and those two are amazing. Same with Grice and uh, Lena when they were both at the Islanders. You know, I think that's like a little bit of an evolution we've seen in goalie. Is that you know now the backup's becoming a lot more important. Yeah, and the back backup is actually a difficult position if you think about oh, it yeah. mentally. I mean. You, you know, you come in one every 10 games maybe and, uh, yeah. you know, like basically you're just getting pummeled in practice <laughs> every day <laughs> and then uh, you've got to like step in there and, uh, you know, win, I guess, half your games. And I think that's one of the one of the issues that uh, Carey Price just can't handle the load for the entire season. And I wouldn't imagine anybody would want to. And then you have people in our media that say, well, he makes ten point five million dollars, so he better play all the games. It's like the world doesn't work that way. A human yeah. body can take so much, you know, and it doesn't matter how much you pay for that human body. It's not going to that doesn't change the fact that you need to have a backup. I mean, Niemi was a disaster last year, even though I, I liked him as a person. And then uh, and then now I'm not really sold with Kincaid. He like lets in these bananas and then makes these crazy 1980s double pack stack, you know, double pad stack saves <laughs> that like will probably be on TSN. So, I mean, I, and he's got a really good Twitter game. I don't know if you're <laughs> following Keith Kincaid. I see the other thing pop up now and again. 
But uh, yeah, so I'm not I'm not convinced uh, that uh, Carey Price is going to get much of a break again this year. And uh, by the end of the season, he's probably going to be worn down again when they need to win games, you know. And speaking of winning games, so now that the Habs have uh, beaten the Blues twice, the Maple Leafs, <laughs> and the Bruins, uh, I think unless the Red Wings or the Wild make the playoffs, the Habs will win the Stanley Cup. <laughs> I think you're right, actually, yeah. I don't know if anybody keeps track of the linear Stanley Cup champion. I don't know if you've ever, if you've ever heard of this before. No. <laughs> right, so it started out with, I heard it first in soccer, and then I heard it again in wrestling, is that... When England played, the f- the first international game was England versus Scotland. I think, I can't remember, say, say England won the game. Unofficially then, they were the first ever world champions in like 1870, whatever it was, <laughs> when the first international game was played. And then from then, somebody tracked, okay, so whenever England lost, that team was now the unofficial world champion because they beat the unofficial world champion. And I don't know if anyone's done it in hockey. So like whichever team won the, obviously whoever yeah. won the first Stanley Cup, then and so on and so on and so on until you get to today i don't know who the linear stanley cup champions oh, okay. are i'll get to that when f- i have some time <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah but there's a fair chance right now this season at least it could be the canadians because we yeah. beat the blues and you beat us so. yeah 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 <laughs> Maybe. Uh, it's just ridiculous how on any given night you know the stars couldn't score any goals all season they score they pop four against the, the against the habs and uh everyone's beaten the Red Wings and the Habs can't beat the Red Wings, but we beat the Blues twice. It's ridiculous. The the NHL is so random. It's the most bizarre thing. And I've always, (laughs) I've always wondered, I mean, coaches and like assistants yeah how much of a difference i'd love to oh. you could never ever quantify it ever i know but i'd love I mean, to know my, my gut check is the coach in hockey means very little at that level i think the, these players are coached so intensely from the time that they're like you know uh 12 13 years old or i guess maybe the time they get into midget let's say if they're like in midget triple a they're getting elite coaching from that point through junior, they maybe make the national team. They're getting really great coaching. And I think by the time they reach the NHL, they're like, I'm set. You know, like they know all the systems. Like what is a coach going to do? What what kind of motivation does a professional athlete need to win really? Like, I don't know. I I can't get in their heads, so I don't know. But I'm thinking I know. like back in the 70s or whatever when you had like, uh, you know, Don Cherry coaching and, uh, you know, the great Scotty Bowman. Maybe there was a you know a difference. I mean, the players were more raw then. You know, they weren't all like there wasn't weren't all these systems already in place in their minds. Uh, and then you know the coach would have a difference at that level. But I think at this time that like, you can just plug and play any coach. I think uh, maybe right. I'm I guess full of that's shit. why. I don't <laughs> well, I don't know. I was I was thinking that yeah. I mean, because maybe that's why then a new coach who comes in has then success. Like right. Mike Sullivan with the Penguins, Cassidy at the Bruins, Craig Berube last year with the Blues. It's just a different voice, and he says, change one thing. Yeah. And that thing is the thing that seems to work. I mean, right. could it have been anybody? Like, it's, I don't know. It's like, true, right? It could have been insane. anybody. And maybe it could have been another thing. But just the fact that they changed one thing, then that tipped the scales against all these other teams who were expecting a different thing from them. I know. And then the shelf life is so low, because then by that time, that thing is all known, right? And then everybody gets yes. used to it. Now we need another new yeah, thing, right. so to speak. Yeah, because the shelf life of an NHL coach must be pretty small, right? Like, I mean... I don't know. I haven't looked at the thing, but it's probably like three or four years. I think the turnover is I mean, pretty fast. Me and Will have said this before, though. There's always coaching jobs, isn't there? They'll always yeah. like look into something or, oh, my mate knows this guy. So, yeah, come and take a look around. And I always make the joke that, you know, GMs don't want to get HR involved. So they just get a guy who's coached before. So yeah. they don't have to fill out all new paperwork. <laughs> it's just true. easier. Yeah. And I just feel like, oh, yeah, my mate knows this guy. Who knows this guy? So yeah. Yeah, we'll give him a shot. Yeah, exactly. You know? It's all this like uh, old boys club. Yeah, still. Yeah. Oh, uh, it's pathetic. So rounding off then, as we finish our talk here, uh, this season for the Habs, um, expectations, hopes, obviously you want to win the Stanley Cup, but would yeah. you be happy with just a playoff run? I mean, what are you kind of, what are you kind of hoping for? I would like to see them get into the playoffs because it makes the city a lot more exciting. Win one round. If they win one round this year, I'd be happy because I think it's the team's kind of building. I mean, I, like you know, we have the old guys are Weber and Price, I guess, and they're you know they're old but not ancient yet. And we've got a lot of new. I mean, I say we, the Habs have got a lot of new, new talent, which I think needs some rounding out. And we're waiting for uh, uh, Cole Caulfield to show up possibly next year after he plays a year in college. 
to maybe actually be a scoring uh, force on our team. Like right now, I think right now they have the highest scoring five on five in the NHL and we have like no star. So they're doing something right. So I think uh, I, I would be happy with making the playoffs, winning a round. Uh, and if the if it's against the Maple Leafs, that would be amazing. I think uh, Habs Maple Leafs uh, first round would uh, pretty much make my year. I've really enjoyed this. This has been a, a lot of fun. Thank you for taking time out to talk to me. Okay. And uh, yeah, well, well, uh, we'll look for your son in the uh, in the twenty twenty five draft. Nice. And I just wanted to say that you guys are an inspiration. You know, to be a couple of Brits making a uh, doing a hockey podcast, um, that I've I, I think I might uh, have to take up doing a cricket podcast myself and just be like <laughs> <laughs> one one Canuck, two wickets. Does that work? <laughs> I think to, I think to mimic the sport though, the hockey, the cricket podcast would have to be about eight hours long. Oh, and right. not much. <laughs> five and not much would five days long, yeah. and we'll like break for tea and uh, yeah. Dude, fi- five days and it can still end in a draw. Yeah, and a tie. Yeah. How crazy is that? I know. I got in a little bit into cricket when I visited India for a while, and this dude was like trying to teach me what was going on on the telly, and I was like, uh, okay. Cricket's <laughs> very a very a very bizarre sport. A very bi- well, that'll be. Next time you come on, then we'll uh, yeah we'll discuss the uh, the finer intricacies of silly made off and uh, and leg and leg side. Okay, let's do that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll sure do my man. homework. Okay, so long. Thanks for Thanks having well. me. All right, there we go. Thank you to Ken. Um, Who, okay, what what are we going to start with? Right. So there's two things we either talk about the uh, Robert Batuzo incident, or we talk about. The only other thing to talk about this week. What do you want to? What do you want to start with? Should we get Bortuzzo out of the way because I feel that's a bit more of a cut and dry thing, you know? Yeah, you're right. And okay. it's chronologically, yeah. Uh, because I feel I feel that talking about all the, I mean, I keep going to, to call it like the Bill Peters thing, but it's not just Bill Peters. It's the the everything no. thing. It's an everybody thing. Thing. Yeah, I'd, you're I hate right. To get. I feel like that's going to take a lot out of us having that conversation. Okay, so um, if you didn't know, Robert Bertuzzo is a massive twat. He decides to, I mean, he pushes Victor Averton into the goal, who's lucky that he didn't smash his face on the crossbar completely. Then when the referee punishes Bertuzzo for this, he decides that his only course of action is to smash Victor Averton in the back while he's defenceless with his stick. And he's now out for four to six weeks. It's it's not the first time Robert Bertuzzo's done exactly this kind of thing before. Funny, huh? Uh, I just All right, let's get this let's 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 do this first. The four game suspension. What are your thoughts on that? Well it's not enough, is it? It's not even it's like I no, had I had in my enough. head like a low bar of right, if he gets five, that's not the worst thing in the world. Because I think expecting a double-digit suspension, as much as it's warranted for for deliberate willing to injure, and not just like willing to injure, like he's he's trying to get Arthur some spine, his back, like that is. If it had gone wrong, he could have bloody paralysed Victor Arvidsson to expect a ten-game suspension from this very light set of player safety officials would be incorrect. But yeah, they couldn't even get that that low bar of five games it's so 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 disappointing it's so disappointing and you worry that it's it's not helping anything giving Robert Bertuzzo that low games to I think it like it's exacerbated by the fact that it happens after he's been given a penalty it's not it's, in the, it's not a hockey it's not a hockey play I hate not, those words but but, but it, it does it, describe something that we can all understand like it's not. Yeah. It's not in the course of play. It's not even in a normal scrum. It's he's purely taking frustration out of Victor Robertson. I I'm still just gobsmacked thinking about it. It's criminal, like absolutely criminal. I know. I was thinking about it earlier today. Um, the the phrase "it's a privilege, not a right." Which I know has been getting some derision because of its placement in the Le- in the Leafs uh, dressing room, and it getting um, getting taken down by Sheldon Keith. But it's right, and we've talked about this before on the show, haven't we, Dan? Like the fact that it is a privilege; it's not a right to play in the NHL. And like yeah. Robert Petuzzo 
should not be allowed to play in the league ever again. As if 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 I'm being asked, he shouldn't be playing at all. The league is not going to be any worse off for taking Robert Matuzo out. He's not contributing anything to the product apart from repeated cross checks after the fact. Like I know the Esther Lindell one last year got some derision for for Lindell's sort of uh, embellishment for for it, but there's no denying that. Batuzo was repeatedly using his stick as a weapon against Lindell. He's had that one against uh, Brock Nelson that's been doing the rounds from a few years ago, where it's basically a repeat of yep. the Arbiton thing. Um, the exact, the exact same thing. The exact same thing. And it's just, what the fuck is wrong with you? What is wrong with you? I, yeah, I'm just amazed. Absolutely amazed, sad and disappointed. And, and like we were saying to start the show, I thought that was going to be the biggest disappointment of the week, and yet here we go. The NHL managed, manages to one-up itself within three days. I'm sure I've said this many times, but one of the reasons we started this show was to provide you, the listener, all of you out there, that just some kind of light relief in your work day. We all have jobs. We all have that slog sometimes, that grind. And I just thought it'd be nice to put something out there that can sort of pass an hour and a half of your day, you know, maybe on your way to work or home from work, whatever. And every, um, we've, I've made this joke every week, every fucking week, there is something about this game that is driving me insane. Player safety, I, I'm trying to not go on one of my rants because I'm sure it really annoys people when I do, but player safety are an absolute fucking joke. And I am genuinely, genuinely livid about a four game suspension. He does the same thing to Brock Nelson two years ago. He missed three games for elbowing Michael Kempney and he got off with a fine for cross-checking Jordan Swartz in the face. And then play safety say, well, he's a repeat offender. No fucking shit he's a repeat offender. How are we going to get repeat offenders out of the game if you give them a four-game suspension in November? Do you think Do you think by the time fucking February or March comes round, Batuzo's going to be like, oh, better not do this again. Do you remember that time six months ago when that thing happened? Of course he isn't. Of course he isn't. And I know we've joked about this before, Will. When we were talking about Ryan Reeves and Tom Wilson, and it, it's kind of, a, it's like half serious, half joking, but this is why players still police the game. This is why players like Ryan Reeves still have a job. Because if Robert Bertuzzo, if you're on the, if you're on the ground on all fours, and Robert Bertuzzo is like standing over you, wielding his stick, what, what's he, th- like, <laughs> what's his reasoning for not doing it? What's his reasoning for not smashing you in the back? He's gonna get fi- he's gonna lose four game suspension and lose sixty grand. Big fucking whoop. <laughs> what stopped Tom Wilson being an absolute massive prick? Was somebody doing to him what he was doing to other people? You've not heard Tom Wilson's name been in the news, have you recently, about dangerous hits or anything? No, no. no yeah. Why is that? Why is that? Because Ryan Reeves fucking clobbered him and Tom Wilson then went, Oh yeah, this fucking sucks. I've been doing this to people. Shit, this is really su- this is really shit. I better not do that again because someone's going to get me like he got me. You want to stop? You want to stop players policing the game? Then player safety needs to grow a set of fucking balls and start handing out. And, and you know what makes me laugh as well? It's like, well, if players safety hand out this suspension, then then the uh, players' association are going to come back and try and challenge it. Fine then, let them challenge it. At least have the balls to do it. You can't just hand out a four-game suspension because play safety might challenge it if you give him 20 or 15 or 10 or whatever. That's not a reason to not do it. I've already tweet. I've already sent a tweet to Ryan Reeves asking him to sort Batuzo out because the fucking league won't. And I did. And the fucking league won't do it. Because, like, play safety are fucking shit. Absolute fucking joke. As, as we said with the Reeves and Wilson thing, like, I do not for one second condone eye for an eye sort of nonsense between... You know, potentially reasonable too. So, but bloody hell, if ever there was a situation like, like I, I enjoy the physical side of the game, really do. A big hit gets my blood pump, pumping just as much as anybody, any other hockey fan. I even enjoy a good scrum after the whistle, a good fight. If you know, provided nothing's too horrendous about it. But like watching Bortuzzo do that to Victor Robertson made me think. You know, it pushes me towards the idea of let's just take checking out because if you take checking out, it excuses any 
you know, let's ban fighting, let's ban all of the the physical side of the game because if people are using it as an excuse to to do things like what Robert Bertuzzo has done time and time again, then I don't want it as part of the sport. Like I enjoy the physical side of it as a sort of accent to the play, but like hockey is the thing that matters. It's the puck and the stick. It's not knocking another person's teeth out or breaking their spine with your with your stick because you're you're too ineffective a defender to stop him getting to the crease without cross checking him into the bar. It's awful. It's absolutely awful. And the NHL has got to do something about it, but clearly they're not willing to. No, they don't give a shit. They don't give a shit. And here's, here's the, in my opinion, here's the chain reaction of what happens, right? Batuzo does that, gets away with it. Don't give me don't give me that you got a four-game suspension. He got away with it. And now, when they play Vegas, or if they play a team who's got a Ryan Reeves-type player, if I'm Ryan Reeves, the first thing I'm thinking is, that guy's nasty. I better put down an early marker. So I'm gonna fucking I'm gonna char- I'm gonna charge into him as fast as I can to let him know that he can't push my team around. And the That's wheel what keeps happens. Turning. Yeah, exactly. And this whole you know, all like <laughs> it's the Department of Player Safety. The clues in your fucking name. Safety. How is that safe? Fuck me. I'm just. And you know what? I've mentioned this to you before, and it sounds stupid, but I am deadly, deadly serious, right? If you're playing the Oilers in the playoffs, why wouldn't you send one of your fucking goons out there to try and injure McDavid? Why not? Because the precedent is falls set over, and nothing's going to happen. Yeah, if he falls over and he's in front of you, just cross-check him in the back as hard as you can. All right, yeah, you probably get a three-game suspension, but you know what? It's worth losing one of your goons if you can take McDavid out of that series. Do Any team's best player. If you get the chance, just fucking annihilate him. Because nothing's going to happen. The league doesn't give a shit. Mate, it's, it's like you said earlier. I mean, maybe. If he's, maybe he'd have... Sorry, if he's, if he's only getting four games in November, he ain't getting jack in the playoffs, is he? Yeah, he might get a game. Not Yeah, if that. If that. It's like Kadri. Like Kadri in the playoffs last year, cross-checks a guy in the face, gets suspended for three games. Cross-checks a guy in the face this playoffs, and it's the rest of the series, which might have been three games. So, what's the point? And what? Where's the? Where's the deterrent? Where's the? Well, fuck! I better not do that. Actually, I better think about this before I do it, just in case. No, I don't. At this point, at this point, Robert Matuzo has purposefully, purposefully injured another player. Not in the game. Not by mistake. He's purposefully injured another player, and the league doesn't give a shit. And it's a player that we all regard as one of the, you know, he's a he's a great player. Like Arbiton's a great player to watch. Yeah, one of the best. It's not like it's it's not goon on goon violence where you're like, ah, oh, fuck it, who cares? Like no one's gonna miss that guy for six weeks. Who gives a shit? No, it's a it's a skilled player. That's what that's what people pay to see. They don't pay to see fucking uncouth mongo fucking twats like Batuzo, who, like you say, isn't doing his job properly. So it takes out on someone who's much better than him at his job. I tell you, I I don't. Jesus Christ. It's the same shit that we see time and time again. It's just crazy. God, do you see that? Do you see that? We're going to have to move off it because if we don't, I'll just, I'll just, I'm honestly, I'm genuinely fur- I'm furious. I am well, it's, furious. It's a good warm up for do the next see, bit. I was going to say though, do you see Alex Kerfoot as well? Nearly fucking crippling Eric Johnson. No, I didn't see that. I, I saw oh, his, because he got suspended, didn't he? Yeah, two games. Yeah, I saw the suspension, but I haven't seen the the hit. Well, no, it's not a hit. He pushes like so. Eric Johnson uh, is at the goal line. Yeah, and Alex Kafut shoves him as hard as he can into the boards. Luckily, Eric Johnson turns his head at the last second Otherwise because he just fucking crumple. Like, yeah, we we'll, we literally at this point we literally have to get to the point where a player is going to leave the rink in a wheelchair before anything serious is done. I don't get what Alex Kafut is thinking. This is how you stop. How you stop players doing stuff like that is by making an example. Someone's got to be patient zero. Whoever it is, someone's got to be the guy. And the league says that's it. You're the guy. I was going to say I thought we'd had patient zero with Rafi Torres getting suspended half a season a few years ago. <laughs> Apparently not. 
apparently not. Apparently you can be a repeat offender and then purposely injure someone and it not mean anything. Like it's like it's like Real Ferdinand a few years ago. He missed a drugs test and he got a nine month suspension from football, which at the time was insane. But they made an example of him. They were like, right, you're high, you're high profile enough. You do not miss drug tests. And if you do, this is what's going to happen to you. And everyone takes notice. And you've not heard of a, I've not heard of a single player missing drug tests since then. I mean, maybe a couple have, but I've not heard about it because obviously they then. At some point, someone does something incredibly stupid like Alex Cafort or incredibly purposely dangerous like Robert Bertuzzo. And the league says, that's it. You're out for, for 40 games. I'm, we're sick of it. You can't do this anymore. I don't get it. I don't. I just don't understand what's to stop a player purposely injuring another player in the playoffs. Why wouldn't you do it? No, because in the playoffs, all bets are off. We know that. Like it's win at all costs at that point. Nobody cares. Exactly. Chances are you could get a St. Louis Nashville matchup in the pre- in the um in the playoffs. So and, be... and and now, of course, it will lead to there might be retaliation next time they play. And then that's another thing you've got the league's got to deal with now because they haven't got the balls to do the right thing straight away. It's just, yeah, you you don't want to you don't want to invoke it, a lot. But when do we end up in sort of Donald Brashear, Steve Moore sort of territory again? I know, it's fucking insane. It's insane. Great, great, great league. For fuck's sake! When are we gonna just sack this off and start covering the SHL? <laughs> I don't know. Do you reckon Meredith can get us a job? I hope so. <laughs> Yeah, I hope so. We're best friends now, anyway. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> we'll just fly out to Stockholm, start living out there, and uh, and cover some real hockey rather than just I don't I don't know <laughs> hooliganism. I thought I thought we'd gone through. We clearly didn't have enough of hooliganism in the eighties and nineties, Dan, because we uh we want more of it. Yeah, apparently so. Apparently so. Bloody hell! <sighs> right. All right. Here we go. <laughs> 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 Back off of Peter's first. Comfortably, everybody. Everyone get ready. Oh, dear. I'm sure you've heard. <clears throat> ah, the hockey's not for everyone, Dan. I don't know if you've heard that. I don't know if you know this. I don't know if literally half the guests we've spoken to in our interviews have, have told us, and by the way, you know hockey's not for everyone, don't you? And we've gone, yeah, that's right. <sighs> I said, there, there's at least a five minute section of every single interview where we have the same conversation and rightly so because it needs to have more attention drawn to it and finally it is having more attention drawn to it and as I said earlier in the, in, in the show God bless you Aku Malio. God bloody bless you man I'm not a religious man myself but for for a player that stood up against hazing in the OHL and tried his hardest to, to whistle blow and shine a spotlight on that to now stepping forward about the institutionalised racism and physical mistreatment of players in the NHL. Akim Alou, Hall of Famer. I give a shit. He's a Hall of Famer as far as I'm concerned. Let's go way back, right? To what feels like three years ago, which was only... The 1940s when Willie O'Ree first... (laughs) Terry Koshin of the Toronto Sun He's writing an article on Mike Babcock. And the story comes out that he made Mitch Marner. Mitch Marner is told to he write a list of the of the 20 players he plays with, who works the hardest, and who works the least. For some reason, I, I still don't know why, even though that's kind of been lost now, but Mike Babcock decides to then share this with the rest of the team. Specifically with it, the... The I think it was the five least hard working players, two two of which were Nazem Kadri and Tyler Bozak, which is just I psychotic. Have, I I have no idea, no, I can't even comprehend why he even thought of this idea in the first place. Let alone, it's a good thing to do or a good idea. I was listening to the Overdrive show as I do now and again. And Odog on there said that he talked to five people who are, who are playing, and they said that he is uh, he loves hockey, he works hard, but he is one of the worst people in the world. It's it's crazy think the, how think of the ground that think of the ground that covers in hockey. Well, <laughs> <laughs> you've got some pretty bad people there. For years, people have been ragging on and dunking on Mike Commodore. <laughs> 
<laughs> oh, I know. But but here we are. Here we are. Like, I don't think I, I don't think I've ever seen. I don't think I've ever seen the word prick used that many times in about eight tweets. <laughs> it must have been like twenty times. And and then to to, to be prick. vindicated, like he was right the entire time. It's like a geezer on uh, on your high street with a tinfoil hat on saying the end is nigh. You know the world's gonna end on on May the fourteenth, two thousand and twenty. You're like, all right, all right, Bill, whatever. And then it comes to May fourteenth, twenty twenty, and it's a bloody rapture. Like that's that's the only thing I can equate it to, as far as like you know far fetched things that have actually come to light. And for for Mitch Marner, nineteen year old rookie. Toronto boy, I don't know if you've heard that. He's not. He's a good old Ontario boy, playing for his. Home, I've it once or twice for his hometown team, like the team he wanted to play for in the NHL since he was a kid. And you get there, and then your coach is a psychotic, abusive person, and makes you do that, like attempts to alienate you from the rest of your team. For the the only like reasoning behind it I can envisage is to make. Marner a pariah amongst his teammates, thus forcing him to have to work hard, you know, off the puck, off the ice, whatever it might be, in order to re endear himself to his teammates. Not that that makes yeah, it's the... any sense whatsoever, but that's the only thing that I can see as like Babcock's twisted version of a positive outcome for this. We've also said this a million times it's the classic, you're essentially in the army. Mm. And your coach will break you down as many ways as possible, tell you you're a piece of shit, tell you you're worthless, turn people against you, to then build you back up how they think you should be. Not how you are, not how you're meant to be, how they think you should be. And that's, yeah, that's the only thing I can think he was doing. Was I'm going to make this kid feel like a piece of shit, and then when I build him back up, he'll thank me for it. Yeah, it is. And you know what? Those fucking Marna Matthews and Nylander negotiations now look a bit different, don't they? It, this this is the crazy thing about the Babcock situation, the Peters situation where are you, and all the other bits that are coming out, like largely through Dan Carcillo, who's doing some fantastic work. It's like everything makes sense now. The the thing with the contract, if it was a case of Matthews and Marner and Nyland are saying, right, I want my money because we have to work for Babcock and Babcock's a piece of shit. It doesn't admonish Carl Dubas from why why didn't... Yeah, if that was the situation, then Dubas must have known. Dubas must have known anyway, but if it's a specific this... negotiating point for his three big young stars, he must have known and didn't act. Dubas didn't act. Shanahan didn't act. Who, whoever the buck stops with, whether it's MLSE not giving the okay on getting rid of Babcock, like it clearly did not happen soon enough. That's something else as well. Is that clearly when Shanahan hired him, he knew what he was getting. He knew what he was doing. Mike Babcock yeah, didn't just he, suddenly he start doing this when he got to Toronto. Exactly. Babcock didn't just start <laughs> doing this when he got to Toronto. Like Shanahan knew what he was doing. Lamorello knew what Babcock was doing. Cal Dubas knew what Babcock was doing. Do you know what? Brendan Shanahan's a canny fucker. Because even even a few weeks ago, when Toronto Hockey Land was burning to the ground and everyone was throwing mud at everybody, his name was never mentioned. Uh, not once. Dubas is getting grief for the negotiations. Babcock's getting grief because he can't coach the players. The players are getting grief because they're not performing. Meanwhile, Brendan Shanahan just sits there in his little presidential suite looking down at his puppets. And no one said, hang on a minute. Like, this guy's above all of them. When's he going to get some grief? And he never does. It's, it's never gets he's mentioned. Not, he's not directly linked to anything apart from the bigger picture. And the bigger picture as it stands is still that the Leafs are better off now than before Shanahan, when Shanahan first came along. Which is true. That is exactly... That is true. But like the day-to-day... That is true. But the, it's not like it's not like nobody knows who he is. I could understand it if it was kind of like, who's the president again? God, you know, I've got no idea. I'll have to look it up. But everyone knows who he is. But it's a situation and you would think at where, some point... like, sorry, it's it's a situation where cool. like the the day to day results are are on the coach. The team building is on the the team construction is is on the GM directly. And while they both report to Shanahan, 
until now, they've both been in a position where it's like, well, Mike Babcock was the best hire available and Shanahan got him. Dubas was the right choice for GM and he's Shanahan's got him. You know what I mean? Yeah. Until we get to a point where, yeah, I think if, if the rug gets pulled out from under Carl Dubas, not that I'm saying it will necessarily, but if Dubas starts to falter, then maybe it will come on Shanahan's head as well of like, oh, you had all this faith in in the young GM sort of thing. But yeah, I just think Shanahan's far enough away from it that he's not going to get hit by the mud. You're right. But you're right. You're it's right. He fu- should be more, more involved in it. Yeah, I understand yeah. why he's not. <laughs> that then that then leads us to Akim Aliu, who we we did we actually spoke about him last year in relation to the uh, the Steve Downey thing because something yeah. something I can't remember what it was but something came up and we we sort of talked about it and went back over the incident and what had happened and everything and he sent out a tweet saying not very surprising the things we're hearing about Babcock Apple doesn't fall far from the tree same sort of deal with his protege. Dropped the M bomb several times towards me in the dressing room in my rookie year because he didn't like my choice of music, and he was of course talking about Bill Peters, and he said to Akeem Aliu, "I'm sick of you playing that N word shit. It's all about ends doing ends and ends fucking each other in the ass or something like that." And he said, "I'm sick of it. I don't want to hear about it anymore." When Aliu was a 20-year-old rookie playing his first season yep. of professional hockey in the AHL at Rockford. Aliu complained to management, as he should, so he did it the right way. He didn't just go and yep. take a baseball bat to Bill Peters' face, which arguably the correct course of action, but that's, that's not, uh, let's not split hairs. So Aliu did the proper thing, he complained to management, and then Bill Peters... No, sorry, I'm getting that wrong. No, he did stand... He stood up to Peters. That in what way it hasn't serviced, but that is irrelevant because, again, Ayu was well within his right to murder Bill Peters. And yeah, Peters didn't like the fact that Ayu stood up to him over his racist comments, not even just like his harsh coaching style. It's not like Ayu got chewed out for, for you know, a turnover on the blue line or something. Like, he was the subject of a racist attack and... Al, you told Peters that wasn't acceptable. So yeah, then Peters went to to Sam Bowman and John Davidson, John John McDonough, John McDonough, president and GM of the Blackhawks, and requested uh, permission to send him down to to the ECHL, which they did, <laughs> which they did, <laughs> and 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 this is just the first step in this whole situation that perfectly sort of encompasses how there are so many people involved in this there are so, and, it, and how oh, yeah. it is a culture at large the nhl at large it's not just bill peters was racist you know using racial epithets against Zachary Malu. it was then the the corroboration and the support from his management in bowman and, and mcdonough to to send him down it's one of those ones where, like, is it's mind mind blowing to hear it. Like, you always know it. It is mind blowing to hear it. Yeah, you always yeah. know it. Like, you know, Smith, Pelly, and Kane getting the stick to basketball stuff. Wayne Simmons having a bloody banana thrown at him. But to have it in such an institutional way and have it really spelled out for you that yeah, it has been happening at a larger level is just shocking and not surprising at the same time. The good thing is. And I hope I hope this is the catalyst. Please, this has to be the chance that we have to to real make to really make a stand now. To that to be like, that's fucking it. That's it. We can't keep doing this like every few months. And the good news is some former players have already come out and said about the kind of person that Bill Peters was. I know Sean McMorrow spoke out on Twitter saying how much how you know, saying how badly he used to treat people how, people, how much he hated him. Uh, Michael Jordan stepped in, who worked uh, under Peters at Carolina, saying that he punched and kicked players while he was the head coach there. I don't know if you saw, before we came on, Rob Brindamore was talking to Sarah Sivian and said, yeah, he did do that. He kicked a, he kicked a player in the back and punched another player in the head while they were sat on the bench. And credit to Sarah Sivian, she's done an amazing job covering this. She then she said that a leadership group of players went to Ron Francis while he was GM in Carolina to get rid of Bill Peters and he wouldn't. 
and it's yeah. because he wouldn't do it, it. It is apparently it's apparently ruined decades long friendships that Francis had had because he wouldn't get rid of Peters after what he did. Yeah, because there are and there I've got are, always, there are kit guys that have been there since the eighties since they're in Hartford. And this is this is the same as Babcock. Why 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 do these coaches just get away with it? And it's like you said, it's the it's institutional in hockey. That's just how it is. And it's all these fucking old white fucking racists in charge of these teams. You know what, hockey hockey's in this is a crossroads. Because if you're a Canadian parent of any child who is just not simply white, any other race, why the fuck would you try and get your kid into hockey? Why? There's already been, I mean, just like scrolling through Twitter today, there's already people linking to articles from two, three, four, five years ago about a player being racially abused, and it's still going on. Well, the whole bloody John Van Beesbrook John Van Beesbrook thing with yeah. Trevor Daly, and now the geezer's is the head of USA Hockey. And that's that was reported widely, and this is this is the thing, Dan. Like, as much as we're at a crossroads, and as much as this is a massive, massive moment for for hockey at large and the NHL especially, like, can can you tell me sincerely that you think anything's going to change? No, no, it's, it's not. It is not. And to to link it back to the start of the show in the worst way possible, it's because in like. A month, two, three, four, five months, however long it is, it's all going to have blown over. Some other, like Eugene Melnick's going to have chopped somebody's dick off and been like, here it is, it's my dick. And that's fucking it. Like, some other shit will we'll have moved on. Life will have moved on. In the same way, no one's talking about John Cherry anymore. No one's talking about Austin Matthews anymore. No one's talking about Patrick Kane anymore. Like, it's just going to be done. Like, the moment will be done and whatever. You can't. Sorry to just keep ranting, but like, there are too many people involved in this. Every single person involved in hockey is involved in this. Everyone is so scared to say anything. Reporters, insiders, coaches, players, everybody. Everybody. It's a fucking... Do you know what it is? It's an an epidemic is what it is. It's an absolute disease. And there are certain people that shouldn't be chastised for not speaking out like Oliver Kylington. Oliver Kylington getting into No, not at all. Yeah. Like it's, what the hell It's not his job to do how, that. How do you expect knowing the sort of situation he's in and the institution that he's trying to become a part of because he loves a game of hockey and he wants to earn a truckload of money, how can you have any expectation of Oliver Kylington or other players in his position to speak out? You can't. No, you're right. That's all. You can't. But yeah, well, you're right. It's, it's, you know, sorry, go on, go on. Like the second, the second, the second Babcock, the second Babcock goes. You then get fifty reporters going. Mm. Well, I actually, I actually had a story about him that I couldn't publish two years ago. Why couldn't you publish it? Because if he publishes it, the team will fucking take away his travel rights or something like that, taking away his ability to earn a living because they're spineless. Yeah. Like the the fucking the, the reporter who wrote a, th- a thing about the senators last year, and the senators were like, "Well, we don't like that. We don't like that article." So you can no, you're not flying with us. Well, how is he supposed to write a story then and earn a living? He can't report and fucking like say all the insiders who are like, "Oh, well, I I actually heard this. Why didn't you report it then?" Because you're too scared to rock the boat. That's why. It's it's hard with those because I'm sure there is a lot of. Yeah, to be too scared to rock the boat, but then I'm sure there are certain situations where, like, say there's a story and there's only one source, and if that story comes out, that source is like, you know, it's other people's livelihoods uh, that are at stake. You know, like the I don't know, the the woman in sales or the the PR guy or whatever. You know, whoever has leaked that story is going to be losing their job, sort of thing. You know what I mean? Oh no, I get it. That's what I mean. But that's what I'm saying though. I, I agree with everything you're saying. That's what I am saying, though, is that no everyone's scared to say anything. Nobody can say anything. Yeah. Because it just all comes back, and then that's it. You're out of a job, or you've lost your ability to do your job, or you've lost your ability to write something or cover something to, to earn a living. But yeah, because the institutions like, at large are propping up the people who are committing these acts rather than... Exactly, exactly. Stamping it out. 
Yeah, I'm not trying to. I'm not. You know, I'm not trying to say like you know, fucking Elliot Friedman gets a text saying something like, "Oh God, this player has just been racially abused." He can't just then go on and say it. I, I get it. <laughs> is it? But it's the institution at large is the problem. <sighs> it's a massive, massive. Why? Why? If you're a parent, why would you? Not only is it expensive as shit to play hockey, there's now a chance, a good chance, your kid's either going to get racially or physically abused. Why Why would you do that? Who wouldn't pay $700 a year plus equipment for the privilege to have that happen to your child? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Plus a skills coach, plus all the travel, plus taking them to practice four times a week. No, fuck that. Here's a football. Go and kick it on that wall there for 25 minutes a day and just get better at footy. That'll do. <laughs> Work. Go and play football. Worst case scenario, you're absolutely paying at wall ball and who doesn't want to be great at wall yeah, ex- ball? Yeah, exactly. Speaking of the beautiful game... I don't, I don't know. I don't know if there's what expectation there is about this, but like, say no to racism. Yeah, there's no equivalent in hockey. No, there isn't. If you don't know, there was a massive issue with racism in English football. Again, to the to the point with bananas being thrown on the pitch, racial insults at players, and there were in the same way, I guess, as in hockey, there were pioneers who changed the game, who changed the way people looked at black footballers. One of the most famous is a player called Cyril Regis, who's sadly passed away now, but an absolute legend who took just insurmountable amounts of abuse and just kind of let it roll off his back. I mean, fucking hell, you know, a bigger man than me, for sure. But he just kind of kept his head down and got on with it. And it only, and it took like 40 years for the FA to actually be like, actually, you know what? Yeah, we need to... We need to knock this on the head. Yeah, you know what, racism? I mean, <laughs> don't knock the, I don't think it's knocking it on the head. In only it's forty years later, <laughs> in only forty short years, will they knocked we, it on the head? We've been able to send out a black and white wristband <laughs> to say, you know what, black people are human too. Do you know what's crazy though? It's for a country like Canada, which, as as Ken mentioned last week, most of the massive markets in Canada are made up of immigrants of some kind. It's a multinational country. I'd, I'd argue Canada's more diverse than the UK is in a lot of ways. Well, well, maybe. I think that, like my perception. I mean, they're both. I mean, they're both very diverse. But again, you know, it's. I've got to... <laughs> it's, <laughs> no, this is it. Like, what can you say? What can you say? It's and it's not just at the NHL that is coming out like that. that to call it a good thing that's come from it is is not the right phrasing, but like the fact that people from all different levels of hockey are now using this opportunity to share their story. Yeah, you know, Dan Castillo has posted a bunch of people who have texted him with their specific stories, be it in various junior leagues, various semi-pro leagues, whatever it might be. You've got people who are who are big in the hockey sort of world, like Nick Mercadante who's come out of his experience at prep school playing sport there and, and the hazing he had to endure and stuff like that. Like, fortunately, people are feeling more confident to share their stories and, and shed more light on just how deep this sort of institutional abuse runs. But where does the change come? I don't know. I don't know. Arguably, we're too... And I guess it's... I guess we're at the point where... You know, like I guess we we had the thing over here a few a few years ago about sort of young soccer coaches abusing players. Mm-hmm. I mean, the fucking Catholic Church has a rug the size of Russia. The amount of fucking stuff they've tried to sweep underneath it, and it, uh, finally we've got to the point where actually hockey is now being looked at under a microscope. Well, I fucking hope it is. I mean, Jesus Christ. I think it's hard to say now because. What kind all, of in it at the moment? Yeah, what it's it, hard it, to all, know. it all happened yesterday, basically, didn't it? Over over yeah. the last forty eight hours, so yeah, we're too close. Like it seems like the flames in the NHL are, from my understanding, doing handling Bill Peters in like a careful legal way. Yes, is is how I've how I've seen it explained, which is why Peters hasn't been fired yet. Um. He's not coaching tonight or last night, whenever it was. Um, which, no, he's not done. Any, he's not taking any practices either. Yeah, he's, like he's basically been suspended, which apparently is the the right course of action, which is a good start. But yeah, I mean, obviously, Bill Peters is losing his job. 
it's just what happens after that. And have you seen the stuff about the Sutters that have come out? No, go on. There's been a lot. Of, I think it's gone through Carcillo again, potentially. I think, yeah, it's, it is through Carcillo. Um, just people talking about how the Sutters, you know, a lot of people would label hockey's first family. Daryl Sutter, Brent Sutter, Brandon Sutter, all, yeah, similar sort of things. Like, you know, Daryl Sutter physically abusing his players and using intimidation tactics and stuff like that. And um, Brett, there was a, a quote band, Brett bandied about from Brandon Sutter talking about Nikolai Goldobin, you know, saying that he's not a man and stuff like that. And just further examples of, yeah, straight to the top, straight to the top. Like you say, everybody's involved. I, I don't know about you, Dan, but like I don't... Not that I don't have anything to say on it, but I don't have anything constructive to say on it. You know, like, I don't have the solution. Like, I don't know what's going to happen. I don't know how we fix this because it's so ingrained into the culture and into the institution that, like, you know, it's like that age-old thing, oh, you, you fire the coach because you can't fire all the players. Well, now you've got to fire all the players. What, what, what do you do when, when that happens? Like, coming off the back coming off the back of Don Cherry and all that kind of thing... Mate. This, this now, like this has to be the tu- this has to be the turning point. When else is it going to be? When else is it going to be? I put- oh. God, my head hurts so much. I hope that Gary Bettman hasn't slept this week. You know what I mean? Because I think that's the the only way that we're really getting change is if Gary Bettman is affected enough by it to try and at least do something within the NHL because yeah you can't yeah at the grassroots thing and like in in junior hockey leagues and and school and college and stuff like to to affect that change is or not I don't want to say impossible but yeah that's that's like a cultural institutional thing throughout the entire country throughout the entire world that's how people men especially are you know like that that's it reminds me of uh, <laughs> absolute rambling episode. This it reminds me of an interview. I think it was with Ryan Strom. I don't necessarily know yeah. it was with Ryan Strom, so forgive me if it's not Ryan Strom. But it was on the Thirty One Thoughts podcast, and he's talking about his dad. He just says in such an offhand way, and then like such a normalized way. Oh yeah, my dad was really tough on us. Yeah, yeah oh, we were scared. We were scared of my dad as a ch- as kids, sort of thing. Oh, dad was the one that you didn't want driving you home if you'd had a bad game, sort of thing. And that's the sort yeah. of thing that we that is so ingrained into male culture that we cannot. We can only hope to change. Like, how do you change four billion men around the world? How do you? But for the NHL, like this is the opportunity to to make a to make a change. Um, I think it's just time. I think it's just time as well. Yeah, definitely. Don Cherry's gone. Great, he ain't coming back. Bill Peters is gone. Great, he ain't gonna coming back. There's two more people out that do this kind of that you know have these opinions and say these kinds of things and have those actions that are just deplorable. And there was a, there was a great interview with uh, with Zidane Ochara saying about how he was hazed when he was a young like a young player and how he hated it and how he said that if I ever got into a position of power in a team I would never do that. I would encourage players. I would help them. I would nurture them, and that's. It just takes things like that. It just takes time to kind of. Unfortunately, it takes time to change this culture, but hopefully that this is a point where. It's accelerated, rather than us talking about God. Do you remember those dark days of twenty nineteen, and if we're still doing the show in twenty twenty nine or whatever, we'd say God. Do you remember that when, all those things happened? It's taken this long for it to finally kind of, get to this point. Hopefully we can be talking about it a lot sooner than that. Definitely. And you know, fucking, I mean, hockey over, hockey over any sport, like has so many appreciation nights for everything. Just start having a month of, and do it properly. Do it properly, of I don't know, fucking diversity awareness or cultural awareness or something. Don't just say you're having a heritage month where you appreciate all the native Canadians who now live in Canada and 
you have a native Canadian come out and drop a puck and then they just whisked off and that's it. You don't just do that. You know, that's you just, that's just lip service. It's not that's not instigating any kind of change at all. You know, I just think like we're in it now. This is it. We have to take the stand now and make the point and get the message out there that you just can't do it. But like I said, unfortunately it's just it's just gonna be time. It's just gonna be time that does it because there's more old fucks who did that kind of thing disappear more younger forward thinking coaches who have a fresh approach to stuff like mental health and race and and sexuality and all that kind of thing will, will come into the league we can only hope and and i hope this is the flashpoint that like you say accelerates us on on in that uh in that regard this show is meant to be fun <laughs> and it's just mate like, like I you said, we joke every week that oh, there's always something bad to talk about, and this I hope this is the bloody apex of it. It's genuinely, I was, I was genuinely, not stressed is the right word. I think stress that word's overused by people like me sometimes. But I was just genuinely sitting there before thinking, God, how do I, how do we handle? I mean, we don't have to do, we don't have to do the show. It's the stupidest thing. We could just not do it. <laughs> we could just not. We don't have to talk about it. But I just feel a responsibility. I don't know why. But I feel like people who can hear my voice need to hear me say these things are wrong and, and hear you say these things are wrong and that realise that we agree that this has to change. I, I just... well, it's, it's the responsibility of anyone. Like, Even if you just have a Twitter account and you talk about hockey, like that is creating content and that is a platform. Like Anyone with a... Yeah. You know, if you've got a blog that gets two views a day, if you've got a podcast that gets one listen a month, like you still have the responsibility if you talk about hockey to talk about this situation and the lack of diversity and the race the, the racist uh, sorry the the racial discrimination and the racist culture that is ingrained into this sport's very soul if you're not addressing it and you're not raising awareness for it and you're not condemning it then you're part of the problem that's that's it that is it, full stop. Like, it, not to dramatise it, but like you're, you're with us or against us, basically. It's, it's cut and dry as that. Like, it is 2019. If you are your Zach Boy Chucks, your Dustin Penners, whoever whoever else is out there that I haven't seen trying to take, you know, straddle both sides of the fence or whatever, like, if you are not condemning the racist and abusive actions of these people in this sport, then you're condoning it and you're supporting it and you're propping it up. So, by association, you are racist and abusive. How do you, how do you do a fade to black on a podcast? I don't know. Should we just get out of here? I think so. All right, everyone, take care of each other. Just love each other, okay? And be nice. And we'll see you next week. Take care. Mm.